So hi, hi everyone. Um, Mark McCann, uh, architect at GP Globalization Partners. Um, working alongside Dave, Mike O'Reilly, and uh, a bunch of other uh, amazing architects um, around around the world on the GP architecture team. So my talk today is around sort of creating that long-term value and building in sort of good feedback loops and good mechanisms so that um, your teams can deliver your well-architected solutions that deliver business impact in a sustainable way, in a way that sort of um, keeps keeps going and keeps feeding into the, the success of the organization. So um, why serverless is always a good sort of question, and um, I've stole a lot of Dave's slides for this as well, so we, we talk about this a lot. But you know, when companies are starting to embrace the cloud, it's not just about migrating your workloads over to the data, you know, from your data center, right? And then, hey, we're in the cloud, we're good, right? That's really only the start of your journey, right? Moving your workloads to the cloud is only the start. Then you need to get into that modernization mindset. You need to start thinking about, you know, what are the capabilities and services that I can offload to the cloud provider? What are the capabilities that I can remove from my workloads so that I'm not doing undifferentiated work? So really, you know, we want to make sure that we are modernizing our systems, and we're very much following that serverless first mindset and approach to how we uh, how we deliver value to our to our customers. So we've got the the flywheel. Um, I think somebody was mentioned earlier they were, they were reading the reading the book and they, they didn't want to see another flywheel. Uh, I think when when we were when we were bringing the book together, we we talked a lot about how do we describe this thing, right? And flywheel really was the the, the best way we could articulate it. Um, so of course you start with clarity of purpose. What is your North Star? What is your goal? What are you trying to achieve? Do you know who your users are and their needs? Right? It sounds simple, but you'd be surprised how often those things aren't thought through um, in any great depth or detail. Right? So always start with your clarity of purpose. Right? When you have that clarity of purpose, you're into the challenge phase, right? and you're thinking about, do we have an environment set up for success? Do we have the things that we need to make our team successful? Can we enable and empower them to deliver value aligned to that clarity of purpose? And then once your team's set up, once you have that environment, once you've got a good environment for challenge, once you've got the psychological safety and you've got a lot of good things in place, then you're thinking about what is our next best action? How do we actually improve? So, and of course, serverless days conference, but for us, we believe strongly in this. Following that serverless first mindset and approach is really the best way to accomplish your next best action, right? You know, start to leverage those cloud services, start to actually um, you know, bring these things to your team, remove the undifferentiated heavy lifting, and think about what can you do next to actually meet those goals, meet your KPI. And once you've got your next best action in place, you're thinking about, okay, well, we've got something working maybe, you know, we've got maybe a sliver of functionality into production, well, how do we do this sustainably? How do we deliver a well-architected solution? How do we make sure that we are following all the good practices and we're not exposing ourselves to security risks or performance concerns or operational concerns? And that's where the long-term value phase comes in when we talk about uh, well-architected. And that's, that's where I'm going to really focus. Um, the majority of today's talk will be around the, the long-term value uh, section. Um, we've written a book um, with Dave and Mike O'Reilly, who's at the back there. Um, it's a lot of our hard-won expertise over our 20 plus year careers, I guess, uh, at now. Um, so IT revolution's gone down really well, and it was great to see the feedback from it. And it's, um, I think it resonates well with the people who are trying to drive modernization and people who are trying to embrace the cloud and embrace serverless. So um, if you haven't already, uh, give it a read and, and let us know what, know what you think. And you know, myself, Mike and Dave, we're all architects at GP. So you know, we've done this in our previous companies. And now we're doing it again at the Globalization Partners. So we want to uh, really um, you know, make it real and then see where, see where the gaps were and see, see what the lessons learned are. What, what are the things maybe we didn't quite capture in the book or capture in our previous experiences? And, and who knows, maybe one day we'll, we'll, we'll write another version, right? So um, the world of work has sort of changed forever, right? And, and this is getting into what we do at, at GP, at, at Globalization Partners, right? So, you know, remote work, you know, global expansion, globalization in general, right? Opportunity is out there for everybody in the world, but sometimes the, the, the access to those opportunities is not available to, to the talented people in the world. So uh, for us, for, for, uh, for GP, what we are really are focused on is removing those barriers to global expansion. If you have, you know, a need to grow globally, we can remove that friction and we can uh, enable you to do so. 
So uh, GP empowers companies to find global success their way. Um, we are the pioneers of the employer of record field, but we're much more than that now, right? So um, we um, basically are trying to develop a, a whole global growth technology sort of ecosystem that enables you to find, hire, and manage employees anywhere in the world. And we can do that rapidly. So within days, you can onboard a new uh, person anywhere in the world um, into, your, into, your, into your company. Um, so it removes a lot of that friction uh, for, for global growth. And I know us in, in Northern Ireland, sometimes those global opportunities weren't always available to us. Uh, that's the same everywhere in the world. So a lot of those barriers have now been removed, which is, which is great to see. So um, that's what we do at GP, and it's a really compelling mission, right? You're removing those barriers, allowing companies to grow, but also bringing opportunity to people who maybe wouldn't have had those opportunities before. We, we take care of uh, enabling a lot of that. So our technology um, enables frictionless global expansion, um, access to rich insights and uh, global expertise. And the most important thing is that compliant um, employee life cycle, right? There's lots of regulations, lots of rules, lots of complexity from through employment law, tax laws, HR laws, you know, setting up your benefits and your payroll. A lot of that is complex and kind of puts companies off hiring you know, outside of their, their local jurisdiction. So we take care of a lot of that complexity and we have uh, a lot of expertise in, in this industry to, to remove that friction from you. So uh, that's what we do at GP. So um, we've, we're, we're very proud of what we've, what we've achieved to date and we're we're excited to see where global growth technology takes us into the future. So, uh, clarity of purpose, finding your North Star. Um, you know, we really are um, you know, driving modernization. Right? We have a current working system, but within GP, we are driving and modernizing that system, very much aligned to well-architected service first uh, principles. Um, and what we want to make sure is that all of our um, teams are thinking about business capabilities, they're thinking about the business KPIs, they're thinking about you know, who are my users, what are their needs, how can I meet those needs as I start to build um, my um, solutions, right? And a lot of it is that the teams own their workloads, right? We want to give teams autonomy over the workloads, right? And we want to put the, the control and the power and the enablement in their hands so that they're not dependent on anybody else. They're, they own their workloads, right? And we make sure that you know, we have our global sort of GP North Stars and KPIs, but at a team level, the teams also have their KPIs and North Stars for their workloads, for their, their, their business problem domain. Um, and, and very much are, those are articulated. So whatever they're doing is aligned to influencing one of those key uh, input metrics and those key KPIs. And we want to make sure that you know, we're not just building features. We're not in the feature factory. We need to balance you know, the, the business and the technology requirements. So as we modernize, as we move to more serverless or leverage more service capabilities, we're balancing delivering business value, business features with also technology improvements and architecture enablements, right? So there's a balancer and the teams can prioritize those things. And we are big advocates of domain-driven design. So, you know, we want to make sure that we have you know, done that decomposition of the monolithic systems that we had into well-defined boundaries, well-defined boundary contexts, and um, we align the workloads to, to those. Um, so we, we uh, build those teams and, and teams own everything. So next phase is the right challenge and it really is about creating that environment for success. And the goal here really is um, for us, especially as, as architects and the architecture team is to really create an environment that enables rapid product delivery, right? and fast flow of value um, to production by these high performing teams right and that's a that's a bit of a mouthful but it kind of captures everything that we are trying to do right we're trying to you know deliver product value aligned to those key kpis and those north stars we're trying to make sure that from idea to production is minutes and hours not days and weeks right and we want to make sure our teams are, are high performing and make sure that you know, we um, have removed any impediments to that um, fast flow and, and to high performance, right? So uh, we want to make sure that's in, that's in place. So um, usual sort of uh, sort of uh, autonomous high performing teams type stuff. Uh, you know, very small, two pizzas size team um, should have all the capabilities they need to deliver um, to production. Um, we want to make sure that they are as loosely coupled and as autonomous as possible. So, they have a very much a build it, own it, run it mindset. Um, and, and we'll talk to this later, but 
those enabling guardrails are built in. So as they vend their accounts, as they set up their CICD pipelines, as they generate code from our templates, all of those good practices and guardrails are, are, are baked in and guiding them along the path and they're getting fast feedback on, on um, what good looks like for, for us. And again, that fast flow of value to production, that's critical, right? You don't want teams sweating for months and months and months not delivering any value. We want them to deliver small, slithers of value, small iterations of value into production uh, in, in rapid, rapid time. So then we're in the next best action, and of course, you know, serverless first, serverless first mindset and approach um, for us is really the, the, the strategy that we have adopted across all of our um, development teams. We are very much a, a serverless first organization. And with serverless first, you're really leading into event driven and event driven uh, architectures as well. So, you know, it underpins a lot of that. So you can see the sort of the, the serverless first mindset uh, and approach that we have. Um, you know, we want to make sure that um, your teams are enabled and they have access to all of this, this plethora of, of serverless uh, capabilities. Um, we want to make sure that they are trying um, sort of API Gateway, Lambda, DynamoDB, you know, they're using you know, CloudWatch and, and uh, X-Ray and all those sort of things first, and they're using EventBridge, and they are using them to solve their problem, and if that doesn't meet their needs, they can also fall back to the rest of the suite of, of services, but what we want to make sure is it's a serverless first approach, it's not serverless only, so if it doesn't quite meet your needs, if your workload characteristics don't quite fit it, there are plenty of other options that, that you can fall back to, but we want to make sure that they have that mindset of uh, trying this, this first before falling back to others. And again, our, our strategy is event driven with serverless, so we're big fans of um, EventBridge. EventBridge is our eventing backbone. Um, we have a multi-account, multi-bus um, approach as well. So we don't have just one big central bus that all the events flow through. We really want to make sure that our event buses are decomposed along with our domains and our branded context. So um, again, always had autonomy and loosely coupling all of our solutions and capabilities so that we don't have one big central bo bottleneck for, for anything. Um, we have a modern account strategy, and I'll touch on that a bit, bit more. The multi-account uh, multi strategy, we're very much aligned to the well-architected sort of multi-account white paper uh, in that regard, which is good. You know, ephemeral infrastructure, teams get sandbox accounts, they can do their, their exploration, and then that goes away after a, a, a period of time. But again, it's all about, you know, uh, enabling teams to experiment in a safe way, right? Without too much friction, without too many barriers for them for them to do what they need to do. Um, we'll touch on this again a bit later, but uh, we have um, a SaaS version of Backstage as our developer portal that uh, we can then codify all of our APIs, all of our events, all of our developer documentation, but also we codify a lot of our templates. And again, I'll, I'll touch on that in a, in a little while. And Dave touched on it here, but you know, Observability is key in, in the cloud and key for serverless workloads. And we're, we're rapidly evolving to leverage open telemetry for you know, that distributed tracing and that insights and the observability across all of our, our serverless workloads. So, um, getting into the sort of the, the phase of the flywheel that we're going to sort of focus on here is about long term value. So, we want to make sure that um, as we deliver, as we give teams autonomy, as we give teams ownership of the workloads, that there is guardrails and guidance and advice and good practices that will help them on that journey and uh, to make sure that they're always delivering a well-architected solution and they're operating at a sustainable pace and they're also operating in a, uh, in a low carbon sort of way as well from an uh, environmental sustainability point of view. And continuous compliance is, is key, right? You can't just say, hey, we're going to be compliant and we'll do a compliance check six months down the, down the line, right? There's too much happening. There's too, the teams are moving too fast. Um, there's too much um, uh, going on all the time that you can't just have compliance as a, as a, as a gate down, down the road, right? You want to make sure that um, we are basically building in continuous compliance. So right from developer IDEs, they're getting feedback on, am I aligned to well-architected principles? We're using CFN Lint, CFN NAG. We have Sneak in our developer um, uh, IDEs and ecosystems. Um, we have it in their, their CICD pipelines. You're getting feedback on, hey, am I, am I roughly aligned to our well-architected principles and practices? Am I secure? Have I exposed any credentials? You want that feedback early in your life cycle. So that's helping enforce that continuous compliance. You want to detect and remediate as much as possible immediately, right? So big fans of AWS Config, 
uh, you turn on all the rules and then you can turn on remediation. So if anybody exposes a S3 bucket, it'll automatically get remediated, right? So that's the type of stuff that we're starting to bake into our ecosystem so that not only is it flagged up, hey, you haven't followed good practice, but we can start to auto-remediate some of those things as well, which is, which is great. Um, we'll talk about threat modeling in, in, a, in a bit, but we want to make sure, and we touched on it on the, on the, the survey there, keeping up to date with all the best, best practices and keeping up to date with all the changes is a full-time job. So you want the ecosystem to help guide you on that. So you don't want to necessarily have to manually go and, hey, we need to update a rule or we need to update a control. You want the services to basically do that for free for you and then just tell you, hey, we've had a new rule for EventBridge in the AWS config. Here's the result. Oh, we haven't secured something or we haven't tagged something appropriately or we haven't logged it properly. That's the type of guidance you want your ecosystem to give you. You want your services to give you that, that, that feedback. So um, how do we deliver well-architected solutions and how do we uh, engage the teams to do that? Um, we use SCORP. So do you all know what SCORP is? You all heard of it before? Um, so Michael O'Reilly uh, coined, the, coined the phrase. So um, the SCORP process is really um, security, cost optimization, operational excellence, reliability, performance, and um, more recently, sustainability as well. So we do this as uh, a team exercise, right? It's not something that we as architects go on, hey, we're going to do a well-architected review and audit you. This is something that the teams do. So all of our teams have um, a SCORP page, SCORP dashboard, and every sprint or every couple of sprints, usually every couple of sprints, um, we'll get a collection of teams together to go over the SCORP uh, page. Now, initially, when we kick that off, you know, typically one of us, the architects run the session, will give a, you know, here's what's updated in the ecosystem, here's what some of the cross-cutting things. But then we get the teams to talk to their workloads, talk to the, their actual in-production workloads, talk about their security improvements that they may have made, talk about any of the things they may have found, talk about their business KPIs, talk about the trends of, hey, we've, we've onboarded a whole load more professionals, or we have an issue over here in benefits, or whatever it may be, right? Um, they talk about the reliability, you know, oh, we had a, we had a, you know, uh, a blip here, but it was fine because we had it all in dead letter queues and we were able to redrive. So every team is going through this, almost like tell the story of your workload, right, in a very sort of safe way, right? Um, performance efficiency, security, it's all there. And they all have uh, wiki pages, confidence pages that articulate this. And we also capture the trends. So month over month, week over week, you'll start to see the trends so you can talk about those. And one of the best things about this is it's a collaborative team exercise, right? And two or three, four or five teams are all in the call, are all in the, you know, in the session, and they're all learning from each other, right? So they're all continuously, oh, we fixed that over here. Did you see that new thing come out uh, this week? That's, that's, that's applied to our workloads, right? And it's a great way for just getting that continuous mindset uh, approach to, to improving, right, and delivering well architected. So it takes, sometimes well architected can be a bit dry. Sometimes the, you know, the white papers can be a bit of a tough read. This makes it really real and really practical and really useful for teams to continuously um, improve on, on, on their workloads. And we, we find it hugely beneficial. Like on a lot of this, it's, it's just small marginal gains. Small marginal gains over time just add up to big, big improvements. So Scorp's, Scorp's great. Um, Threat modeling is also another massively uh, beneficial activity for any team. And all of our teams uh, do threat modeling for their workloads. And again, this isn't something that's um, done to the teams. It's something that the teams do collaboratively. You know, they do their data flows of their workloads, and then they identify what are the threats and how we've got to mitigate those threats uh, from you know, spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, um, uh, elevation of privilege. And these are some of the the most collaborative, fun sessions that we have in, 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 with our teams is going through, well, how are you going to mitigate that? You know, how are you going to lock down that bucket? You know, what authorization and authentication checks do you have? You know, does anybody have access to the thing over there? How do they get access to that? You know, and it really gets them into that sort of uh, threat detection and mitigation mindset. That's a really, it's a really great way for them, especially for new people, it's a really great way for them to understand their architecture, understand their workloads, and understand how does data actually flow through this system and what are we doing to protect it at all the different layers of, of, our, of our architecture. So a, if you haven't already, the stride threat modeling is, is, is brilliant. And again, I think we've, we've talked about this and we've done YouTube videos and stuff on this as well. So uh, you can go into more depth than that. Education is a full-time job, I think, especially in the cloud. 
and you know um, we've definitely seen the cloud providers AWS as, uh, um, in particular getting much better at um, lowering the barrier to, to the cloud right um, we have you know, our developers have access to Udemy they have LinkedIn learning um, but a lot of the free offerings from AWS are getting much much better right skills builder if you haven't already used it is fantastic resource there's lots of um, you know, uh, capabilities and courses and workshops that are, that are, that are burning. Um, the AWS workshops, I use them every week. I think they're a fantastic resource for, for you know, getting up the, up the speed. And like some of the stuff we're, we're going to touch on later, there's workshops that, that directly set this stuff up for you, right? So it's, it's, it's great. And what, what we're looking for here is that across all of our squads, all of our teams, there's a shared understanding of what, you know, what this looks like, what good looks like. You know, and with the score process, with the well-architected reviews, with all the stuff that we do, there's a good sort of base understanding that when we talk about API Gateway or DynamoDB or Step Functions or Lambda, you know, people understand roughly what you're, what you're talking about, right? And uh, but it's, but it's a full-time job, and, and keeping up to date with all the all the changes is, is not easy. Um, infrastructure code. Um, Everyone doing infrastructure code now, right? Nobody's doing stuff in the console, right? Right? Everyone, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, so yeah, everything's infrastructure code. Um, everything is done via pipeline with uh, GitHub, GitHub Actions for for us with OIDC. Um, beyond Dev, there's no write access to the console. Again, trying to put some enabling constraints in place to make sure developers are automating and, and baking the the good practices into their their CI/CD pipeline. Um, and we want to make sure that um, they're being enabled with good practices. So like I mentioned, we're baking in CFN Lint, CFN Nag, Sneak, all those sort of things into your pipeline. So you're getting rapid feedback on, hey, you're not quite following good practice or something's not quite right. Um, and again, there's been lots of evolution of, of those type of capabilities in the last year or so. The, the tooling is much better. So like a lot of the guidance and advice we would have to do in a formal review is now encoded into the the heuristics and the checks and the balances that these uh, sort of tools are, are giving us, which, which is great. So getting into the meat of it, right? Um, there's lots going on in the cloud. There's lots of good advice. There's lots of well-architected papers. There's lots of um, sort of capabilities. It can can be a big cognitive burden for everyone on your team to understand this stuff. So you want something to help um, lower that cognitive burden. So um, we're leveraging Trusted Advisor and the cloud intelligence dashboards, which are an open source uh, capability. But what you really want is contextual, real-time learning and insights for your workloads, right? We mentioned earlier we were big fans of domain-driven design, so we've broken up our solution into multiple domains and bounded context. There's a, an account per bounded context. So any of this uh, guidance and advice is contextual to your code running in your accounts, right? So you're not seeing everybody's workloads, you're not seeing all the findings for everyone else's sort of uh, resources, you're seeing guidance and advice tailored to your team's workloads, right? And that's massive because it massively removes a lot of that cognitive burden that um, teams have. Um, Trusted Advisor is fantastic and again, it's a nice, brings together a lot of different sources around your cost, around security, around optimizations, around performance, around reliability. A bit like the score sort of page that we do manually with our teams, Trusted Advisor is pulling a lot of that uh, real-time data uh, together for, for you. Um, and then we also have higher level org views because we have a multi-account strategy. Um, we can, you know, teams can have their, their team level view, but we also have across all of the workloads we can then to bring all that data together in, in an organizational view so that we can get insights um, around that at, at the org level. And that, like we keep mentioning here, it's all about continuous improvement over time, right? Small marginal gains add up. Those good things add up. So a bit more about the um, sort of cloud intelligence dashboards. Um, so you can see the link here. Um, so go to Well Architected Labs, uh, cloud intelligence dashboards. They have um, demos on there. They have um, deployment guides. They have a workshop on there that'll guide you through setting this up. It'll even have you know, some of the FAQs have about you know, what does it actually cost to run this as well. So everything that you know uh, you want to know is is on that link. It's it's a fantastic resource, and they're continuously adding new capabilities and new um, new dashboards to it. But really, like a lot of this, it's all very much aligned with well architected. It's all very much um, giving you real-time guidance and advice, and you know, you're getting that financial visibility, 
right? Sometimes teams don't really care about the cost, but that's you know, I'll talk about this in the, in the next slide. Um, you know, you want to be able to you know give teams easy access to the data so that they can be empirical and data driven about their decisions, and it all goes back to you know their north star, their KPIs, and the work they're doing. It's a lot easier to make those arguments for hey, we want to improve this bit of the architecture if you can start to actually come come at it with data, right? Hey, we want to improve the cost of this. We want to improve the reliability. We want to improve the performance of this, and you have data to back it up. You have all the dashboards and the data and the analytics to to actually back back that up, which is, which is great. So um, in the cloud, cost really is your architecture. So um, you really want your teams to understand what is actually driving the cost of their solutions, you know, and, and is it worth it, right? So uh, we do this as part of the score process, but it's also you know, something you should be doing regularly. You should be um, challenging your team. Is this service worth it? I see we're spending money on X. What are we getting in return for that spend? Could we spend that money somewhere else? You know, is it actually helping us? achieve our goals and our, on our aims you know is it actually helping us um you know uh, deliver value to our to our customers and uh, and what you really want to get to is start challenging your teams can you optimize that can you can you tune that and still deliver on your your business value and still deliver on your SLAs and your SLOs and SLIs can you can you remove some of these capabilities and still deliver value? So you know you want to you want to get into that sort of a mindset, right? And again, trusted advisor, cost explorer, compute optimizer. Your computer out there is burn up because that's going to look at your running workloads and, and give you recommendations on hey your EC2 is too big or your your load balancers are a bit idle or your lambda is tuned too high. It's going to give you real. You know, targeted guidance and advice and recommendations on your actual running workloads. Like that was really hard to get previously, right? You're getting all the expertise that sort of we have built up over years. The tools are now telling you, the, the ecosystem is now informing you of what you should sort of think about doing next, what you should put in your backlogs for the next sprint or the sprint after that, which, which is great. And um, just while we're on it here, your cost is a good proxy for you know, your carbon score in the cloud as well. Um, so. There is the carbon score tool um, on AWS and AWS console, but it's a bit granular. So as a good proxy, um, your your cost is a good is a good uh, proxy for um, you know, lowering your your carbon footprint of of your running workloads. Um, I mentioned this earlier, but we have a you know multi-account strategy, uh, very much aligned with the well-architected um, multi-account sort of white papers, um, which are great if you haven't haven't read them, but really allows us to um, you know. Again, break up our workloads and vend accounts that are appropriate and, and have all the controls, the service control policies, the, the config rules, the tagging, all of that is incorporated into that and it's codified into that um, sort of uh, ecosystem. And like I mentioned, you know, it's, it's a lot easier for a team to you know, um, understand their workload running if it's in just their account. Their workload is in their accounts, right? Nobody else is in their accounts, right? So it's much easier to see, well, any anomalies or any sort of trends that are that are going off the rails, you can you can really lower that that cognitive burden, and and there's lots of other reasons why you want to have a multi-account strategy, limiting your blast radius, auditing your know, security, lots of good stuff. So that white paper is 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 well worth uh, reading and and breaking up your your ecosystem into you know multiple accounts is, is a good thing, and and it doesn't really come with too much over overhead or additional costs, and you know we can we can um, it's it's well worth the, the return on investment. Um, to do so, um, we use a, a Count Factory for Terraform, um, but we then expose this capability to our teams, right? So we have uh, Rudy Backstage, so Rudy is our SaaS um, Backstage uh, implementation, which is a great capability. So teams, as they start to you know, um, try to think about what is their business problem they're trying to solve, you know, what is the bounded context, they then can submit a request for, hey, I would like an account for this Bound the context in this domain as part of this value stream, and we can vend that account then in minutes, um, so that you know they can then start delivering value to to their users, right? Um, and we also have some of the checks and balances in here to make sure that they're not just uh, in the build trap, right? They're not just building for building sake. So we have some guardrails here around, you know, do you have that clarity of purpose? Do you know your KPIs? Do you know who your users are? Um, we make sure that they have solution clarity. Well, what is it you're trying to build? Is it going to be, you know, Lambda, Dynamo, Step Functions, you know, API Gateway? What, what, how are you going to meet that need? How are you going to solve that that problem for your business? Um, 
when we vend these accounts, again, all of these well-architected best practices are, are incorporated into them, and the tools are enabled as well to, to give that to the teams. And we want to make sure that the team is thinking about, well, when's your well-architected review scheduled? When have you got your Scorp dashboard set up? Do you have your domain-driven design documentation in place? Have you got your events articulated well? Do you know your API contract? These are the type of things we want to make sure the teams are thinking about before they you know, go all the way to production, right? And again, I've, I've touched on this, but I'll, I'll, I'll go at it again here. You know, um, team enablement is key, right? You want to enable and empower teams with this real-time contextual data, and these tools are fantastic. Um, Recently, the well architected tool, which we're big fans of, has been improved quite a lot. Um, and again, it really helps support a multi account approach as well. So we have a centralized, well architected account, and then we basically set up those workloads and then we share them, those reviews, with the teams in their workload accounts. So they then are getting you know, um, you know, their you know, review template. Some of the answers are, can be already filled in. You can share some of the answers. We share that with their account. We then do the well architected review with the team. They fill in the answers, and then we can collate all the results together into a, a centralized dashboard that allows us to see across all of our squads where the well architected review findings are, where the gaps are. It also um, incorporates with uh, Trusted Advisor and Compute Optimizer, so you can start to get real time well architected capabilities as, as well. Um, so lots of good stuff for the teams, right? So Trusted Advisor, Security Hub's another great capability, right? It's just sitting there scanning for any sort of security issues or anything that's not aligned to the security best practices. And the teams are getting real-time guidance and advice on, hey, you haven't associated your, your ACL with your WAF, or you haven't set up your, your logging properly for your S3 bucket, or you haven't you've secured your, your endpoint appropriately, right? Really timely, targeted, real-time guidance on how to resolve any sort of findings that you know, these tools are, are, are finding, so really great. Uh, Resiliency Hub's got a lot of um, lot of attention over the last sort of couple of months, a lot of new features in there. Again, it's helping give you guidance on how can you A, define your recovery point objectives and your recovery time objectives, but also how, can you, how you can achieve them, and it can continuously scan for, hey, have you got your backups turned on? Do you have your point in time recovery points set up for your Dynamo? Again, real-time guidance and advice. So all that expertise has been democratized, right? It's been baked into these tools, which, which, is, which is great. Mentioned the well-architected tool. Um, don't want to drain it too much, but again, we, we have it at the team level, but then we consolidate all the reports and all the findings at an organizational level so we can see where, where the trends are, what our team's struggling with, where the gaps are, where is we as the architecture team, where can we invest some time to either educate or put in, a, put in another check or maybe enable something else to, to help the teams uh, deliver, deliver more. And, and again, all of this feeds back into the SCORP process. So those SCORP dashboards that the teams are reviewing, they'll be fed with this data. So they'll have snapshots of this, they'll have screenshots of this, or they'll have just links to this, and also all their other sort of um, dashboards. So that doesn't stop, right? You know, all the learnings we have, all the well-architected good practices we have, we want to make sure that the next time a team is vending a workload or, or creating a new capability, that those good practices are incorporated back in. So. We use Backstage and we have Backstage templates that have all of our good practices baked in. So the next time a developer wants to you know, create a new account, they're getting the benefit of that. Whenever they want to you know, uh, create a, a, a particular solution, say an API gateway with DynamoDB and a Lambda, they're going to our Backstage Rudy um, capability, our dashboard or developer portal, and they're vending that and it's setting up their CI CD pipeline, it's setting up all the checks and balances, it's setting up you know, a good base that incorporates all of those well architected good findings in there. So the bar is always rising for the teams, right? So it's easier for them to adhere to all these good practices and standards uh, over time. Um, we also use this as our portal for API documentation, run books, playbooks, our event catalog, all in you know, our backstage um, uh, portal. Um, these are some of the old old, old versions. It's, it's had a rebrand since then internally, but uh, um, I put, put the billing workloads on there, Mike, for, for Mike, uh, just to keep him happy. And you know, we touched on this quite a bit. You know, we want to start small and evolve, right? Complex systems that are successful 
didn't start off as a complex system. They start off as something really simple and small. So that's what we're really trying to get to is you know, we've removed a lot of the friction. We've removed a lot of the barriers for you to deliver value quickly into production. So we want teams to start small and then evolve, right? Add more features and capabilities later as it evolves. And, and Chloe, your, your talk earlier around, you know, it's evolving. You're adding in more stuff, right? That's that's what you want to see, right? You don't you can't think of some of this stuff up front. So you want to build an ecosystem that enables evolution, right? And a lot of this feedback, a lot of this guidance really helps team evolve along the right path, right? So that's us. Um just gonna close out now. So uh, GP, GP Meridian Suite is our sort of flagship global growth tech sort of product that um enables you know companies of any size to to Sort of hire anyone anywhere in the world. It's 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 massive, and removing barriers to to global growth is is uh, something that's very exciting for us. Um, obviously, the flywheel. Uh, just to reiterate, you know, and we'll probably do some more talks at you know different sections of the flywheel and tease out some of the other other sections. But um, this one was really focused on you're well architected and then delivering long term value and. And you can see, like all of the stuff we talked about, it feeds back into well, what are, what's the next KPI we should influence? What's our next goal? You know, you know, what have we what have we what have we enabled now? So we've done all this work. What can we do differently now? What innovation can we apply? What capabilities can we leverage that the business can take advantage of? Because we've gone through this loop a few times, so uh, that's what we're, we're aiming for. So just to finish off, you know, and um, we've all seen this. You know, it actually, was in the survey, right? Serverless and serverless first. It's not easy. Right, there's a lot of complexity. There's a lot of challenges. There's lots of, you know, um, there's still gaps in how how this works. Right, testing and developer experience still needs improvements. Right, but it's better. You know, we've offloaded a lot of that complexity and a lot of the undifferentiated heavy lifting has now been offloaded to the cloud providers, so we can focus higher up the value chain. And that's where you want to be. You want your teams and your sales to be delivering business impact. Right, you don't want to be doing tech for tech's sake, you want to be delivering value to, to real users. Uh, so it is definitely better. Um, we want to create high performing teams. And you know, that's not just for, for our organizational sake. You want your developers to be the best version of themselves. You want them to have the experiences and the skills so that you know, if they're not working for us, they could go work for anybody, right? That's kind of what we're trying to get to. Right? Educate, enable, empower teams to be as high performing as they can be and become world class effectively, right? And always about rapid product delivery, right? You know, the, the goal of ours for, for quite some time is to go from idea to production while we're in the product discovery meetings. That's kind of what we're trying to get to, but we're not quite there yet. We'll keep iterating maybe another five or 10 years before we, we truly get there, but that's, that's where it's heading, right? And always about fast flow value, right? You know, if there's an issue, if there's a new feature, you want to be able to get that into production within minutes safely, right? Uh, so that's what we're, that's what we're aspiring to and always well architected and always uh, following uh, serverless first. So that's us, that's me. Um, reach out on LinkedIn or Twitter um, and you can gp.com for um, some GP uh, information. So questions? And see, you mentioned Yeah, it, 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 it's a great, great question. And config, when it first came out, was very expensive, right? And so there's a trade-off there, right? Is it worth it? Is always the question you got to ask, right? And um, like things like Security Hub basically have config under the hood, right? That's that's what it's leveraging on, under the hood. And it's, it's something that always comes up. It's like, you know, are these rules giving us return? For us, it is, definitely. But it's... and. The AWS ecosystem has been very good at starting to, you know, over time, remove some of those costs. As we bring in, like, even if you bring in third parties or SaaS products or whatever, you know, that's also part of the consideration for when we're doing assessments of any sort of SaaS product we may bring in. Is it well architected? What's the cost? What are the pricing models for those things? Those are all characteristics you got to take into account. So, like, like everything we just went went through there. Um, Teams should understand all of these aspects, you know, security, cost, operational excellence, reliability, performance, and sustainability, right? So it's the same for us. So for all of this, and, and those dashboards, those uh, cloud intelligence dashboards, 
really start to show it. So when you're down to the workload level, you're going, well, we're spending this much for VPC, we're spending this much for config, we're spending this much for Lambda, this much. That's a great way of you know, having those conversations about, hey, you know, we're, we're, we've all, already got CFN Lint and CFN Nag and all this sort of stuff that's giving us the same advice. Is it worth it having this extra check? And that's a trade-off. You, like, your your trade-off might be different from ours, but that's that's a good conversation to have. Yep. Yeah. And and like some of the stuff is because teams are moving so fast and because you know, you're growing new teams. You want to make sure there's a good baseline of your well architected good practices that they can't fall below as well. So there's a there's a trade off there. And like some of the more high like super high performing teams, like some of the make make squads or whatever, they sort of know this stuff intrinsically, right? They don't need the, as many guardrails, but you want to make sure the guardrails are there still, right? Yep. Um, great, great question. Um, the event storming is is a big big technique that we we use for um, sort of decomposing and thinking about you know, how the flow of those domains are and breaking down those bound of context. So um, we do a lot of um, event storming <laughs> with all of our teams. And it's, uh, and again, because we're all remote, it's great. You just fire up a Lucid dashboard and away you go. You start mapping out the events and start breaking it down and and. You know, um, actually, Ben, ben Ellerby and the LAOS guys, they did they have a great um, blog that we, we leverage quite a lot on the um, their event bridge storming is the one that they use. But um, effectively, it's the same sort of process. And, you know, you're breaking it down, breaking down your, your, your problem domain, breaking it down into sort of those discrete domains, and then you're bound to context. And then you're, you're effectively going, hey, well, okay, what's the event bus? For this, what's the event bridge instance that's going to actually sort of um, you know, uh, be the eventing backbone for some of those domains? So, yeah, event storming is is, is a big technique. Like we we do use a lot of um, online collaborative tools for you know uh, doing North Stars. We have you know, templates for that. You know, event storming, um, worldly mapping for mapping out your tech stack and your value chain. Um, lots of, yeah, lots of techniques. Plus, I would say. A Domain-driven design has been about for ages, yeah. you know what I mean? And it's very academic and very boring, to be honest. So trying to explain to a load of teams, this is how this works. They don't want to hear it. So the way we've set up is, um, or sorry, the way GP have set up, um, a workload is an account, so there's separation. So at the point when the team are creating an account, i.e. a brand new workload, i.e. a domain, you say, what's this for? What's the KPIs? What's the contract? What's the events? What's the business capability? So you establish that straight away. If it's, we're building this because he told us to, say, no, you're not allowed. Yeah. So you, you effectively, there's a map of all the domains. And then the way, and you can't just kind of cheat. Like, remember, we, when we did DDD in Java, you can kind of cheat and just call something. Everything is connected by EventBridge. So there's lots of kind of soft governance built into the system. Yeah. So it's, it's, it makes it real, if you know what I mean. So I find teams are talking about business entities, capabilities and domains, but it's not academic. It's actually what the system is yeah. built around. And all of those dashboards went through, we have them, everything's tagged according to the domains and the branded context and the workloads and the value streams. So you can very quickly zoom in on, well, what's the cost of this value stream? Or this domain, or this bound of context. What are the findings for each of those things? So you can zoom in and zoom out, uh, because you have your well, well articulated domains and bound of context. Right, it becomes a lot easier to have those type of conversations, which is great. And I think there's a, there's a convergence between like domain driven design, event driven architecture, serverless, and well architected. It's really interesting them coming together. Yeah. I, we're still trying to figure it out, yeah. but I think it's a lot of these older techniques are now easier than they were. Go ahead. Yeah, we haven't I haven't really done that yet. Um, we're still you know breaking up everything and making it more, but um you know, a lot of the the capabilities and services we have, it would be pretty straightforward to do, hey, well, don't run it in this brand of context, run it over here, right? Or bring that together. And it's, it's, it's some of the conversations we would have, it's, it's like the gray area. 
does this belong, does this component or capability belong in this domain or this domain, does it belong in this boundary context or this boundary context, right? And you don't want it to be too concrete in either, right? You want to be able to evolve and say, oh, okay, that moves over there. And because everything's automated, because everything's infrastructure's code, because we have all the backup and recovery and all the point in time recovery, it's pretty straightforward to migrate if you need two data from one to the other. But we haven't really yeah. had that data too much yet. And I think the, the, the tool is not great for merging or migrating an account, but because everything's infrastructure is code, and you can just say, let's blow away those two and create a third one. Yep. But our cloud engineering team get a bit pissed off because that's extra work for them, but we'll, we're optimizing that <laughs> as well. Yeah. All right, that us. Um, so big thank you to Mark, thank you. Um, again, um, massive thanks to Mark and, and Chloe for, for, for both talks. Um, and, and a big thanks. You can probably see, I mean, I think there was a nice thread there between the way Chloe was talking about the e evolution of, of, of a service and, and how something grows into something else. And then we talked about how do you sort of, you know, enable an organization to do this type of stuff. So I think Mark kind of illustrated how that kind of approach is enabling an organization to be, you know, service first, well architected. GP is interesting. It's a startup turning into an enterprise. And some of these things are the building blocks that will make that happen. Um, so anyway, so um, thanks very much, Mark. No problem. Thank you.